You're the God of this city. You're the King of this people. You're the Lord of this nation. You are. You're the light in this darkness. You're the hope to the hopeless. You're the peace to the restless. You are. Good morning. How good is it to be back? Yeah. Gee, it's um, there's something nice about um, going to church in your pajamas, but it's good to be back here with clothes on. <laughs> and welcome to the live stream. First time we're live streaming, so I'm going to pray that that works. And uh, let's just bless the Lord for this opportunity. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, today, as always, is all about you and your glory. Your name's renown that is worthy to be proclaimed across this whole entire world that you created. We're so glad to be back as your people. Would you receive all the praise now? As we worship most of us from our hearts and our minds and not using our mouths to sing. But Lord, what a privilege for these uh, brothers and sisters of mine behind me who get to sing on our behalf. And as they sing, we, we want to say, Lord, we agree. We agree with what they're saying because you're worthy of praise. In your name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing two songs together via these people. <laughs> so would you like to stand? Um, just to be clear, we, we're not allowed to sing so please try not to, to do that. But we can worship in any other way. <laughs> Be lifted up, high above the heavens. 
remember that you are risen from the grave this morning. It's the reason we meet every Sunday from home over the last six months and we're so grateful to be here in person to praise you and to gather together under your word this morning. So we pray that Jesus would be given all the glory in us, his church this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please take a seat.
Good morning, Northern Life Baptist Church. Isn't it wonderful to be back in our building again this morning? It's been a long time and what a holy space that was this morning as we were able to worship together. We're so glad you've joined us today and we really pray that you'll be blessed whether you're here in person or whether you're online uh, watching our services live. There are a few announcements for today. The first one is for our women. Our Mosaic women are having our first event for the year, which seems crazy being October, but our event is called Together Apart. So we're going to be together in different homes. So together but apart. So all the details are on the invitation. Um, the, it's on Saturday the 31st of October. The RSVP details are there as well. So please make sure you check Facebook or you can grab a flyer at the front door or you can check your Together uh, email for more details there. Next Sunday is a celebration and baptism service. Celebrating because it's actually our anniversary of being in our building 12 months since we've been here. We have been longer out than we've been in, so even more of a reason to celebrate. But Virginia Matthews is being baptised next Sunday. So we just yeah, we celebrate with Virginia. Uh, that's a really special day. Because of that, next week you're going to need to register to attend church. Because of COVID, we are limited to 100 people. So this week you will receive an email about how you can register to attend uh, next Sunday. So please uh, be aware that that's going to be in your inbox. Oh, Lockie Ford's getting baptised at night. Praise God, Lockie. That's a big day. That's a big, worthy celebration service. So how wonderful. Today's bulletin that you normally would receive when you come to church has been emailed to you this morning. It's the Together email. Can I please encourage you to open the email and read it? It's full of lots of things, lots of bits of information they actually really need to know. They will help make your transition back to church uh, smoother and uh, lots of information about all the things that are coming up as well. So please check your inbox. Um, and if you're new to Northern Life and you don't receive our email, you can go to our website and you can subscribe Subscribe, and then you will receive the email and you'll be kept up to date as well. This morning and into the future, because of the COVID situation, uh, the way we do morning tea and supper at night is going to be a little bit different. You'll notice that tables are set up in the hall and in the foyer. So what we're asking you to do is to please, after the service, Go and find a table, find a seat, and people will be there to serve you. So we're not allowed to mingle. You just need to be seated, and we will come to you as quickly as we can with some morning tea. So if you could remember that, that would be great. All right, we have our now that have become very famous kids' videos for you to enjoy. So kids' ministry is on today. Um, enjoy this kids' video. So tell me, when was this? About the time of the Jewish festival. And where did the event take place? On the far shore of the Sea of Galilee. Witnesses? Well, there were probably 5,000 men, plus women and children. There were a lot of witnesses. Quiet! We don't need to know how many women or children were there. Only men matter in this society. <clears throat> so tell us, Phil, what exactly happened? Well, Jesus crossed the Sea of Galilee and a large crowd gathered because he was doing all of these amazing healings and miracles. I mean, I don't blame them. Jesus is awesome. I will follow him for the rest of my and life. And then you suggested to go and get some bread? Well, no, Jesus did. We went up a mountainside and when he saw the crowd that had gathered, he just had deep compassion for them. It was getting late and he knew everyone was getting hungry, so he asked me, where shall we buy bread for everyone to eat? Now, I realise Jesus was just testing me because he knew exactly what he was going to do. But anyway, at the time, I totally doubted Jesus' powers. I said to him, it would take half a year's wages to buy enough bread for everyone to eat. Yes, it would. Did Jesus ask you to go and steal bread and fish from the local shops? No, no, no. Jesus would never teach us to steal. Look, another disciple 
found this kid. That will be all. We'll ask the other disciple what happened. State your name and place of birth for the record. Uh, Andrew, um, brother of Simon Peter from Bethsaida. What did you see on that day near the Sea of Galilee? Um, there were a lot of people and everyone was getting hungry. Um, Jesus told us to go out into the crowd and see if anybody had anything. And then there was this one kid who gave us everything he had that day. Five small barley loaves and, and two small fish. Are you sure? One hundred percent. I carried the food back to Jesus myself. I saw it with my own eyes. Then what did Jesus do? Uh, he took the food and gave thanks for it and uh, told us to distribute it amongst everyone as much as they wanted. And it fed everyone. Yeah, like a true buffet. <laughs> Never been so full and satisfied in my life. After all of that, there was enough to fill 12 baskets of loaves and fish. Surely Jesus did a miracle here. There's no way he could feed over 5,000 people, even if he went out to steal from local places. I agree. This has to be a miracle. All right. Sign here and you can go. There's one more person I'd like to speak with. The child. Hey buddy, would you like a lolly for Mr. Crocodile? Yeah, sure. This is Detective Locke, and I am Detective Key. Could you tell us if Jesus forced you to share your loaves and fish that day? No, I offered it to him. No one forced me to. But why would you do that? I don't know. I want to be generous, like God was generous to me. That was very kind of you. Is there anything else you'd like to tell us? Yeah, I loved how Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever follows me will never be hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Do you know what that means? <laughs> hey, kids and youth. It's time to head downstairs to continue our program. Follow your leaders. Uh, kids, it's time for you to leave now. They get better and better, don't they, the kids' talks. What a wonderful job they're doing. Can I please encourage you to say hi to the people around you. Welcome the people in front and behind. Thank you. Good morning, let's pray. Father, Lord, maker of the universe, maker of heaven and earth, we come before you to praise and glorify you. You are our provider, our comforter, our refuge and our strength, our beginning and our end. You know all because you are all. You look after yesterday, today and tomorrow. Unchanging, Lord, you are our rock and our foundation. Thank you, Lord, that you sustain us, build us, enable us and surround us with certainties and promises that no one or nothing else can give. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to meet together again. Thank you for the blessings you provided our church during lockdown, for unity, for, for financial provision, for new people and for new followers, for technology, resources and new formats that will continue to enrich us into the future for people who opened their homes to do church together, for the many who made phone calls and sent text messages, for the meals and the meal makers, for Zoom meetings and prayer meetings, for love shown to each other because of your sacrificial love for us. Bless this new hybrid season. Let us see the fruit of these live and live stream services. 
Lord, we ask that you protect and bless those who have lost loved ones during our time apart. We pray for Lorraine and her loss of Ron, and Val and her loss of John, and for Greg and the increasing restrictions he has to endure, and for Joy as she tries to comfort and care for him mostly from a distance. Bless and nurture them all and let them feel your particular comfort at this time. We think also of others who've experienced loss, loss of health, jobs, relationships, opportunities, connection, confidence. Let them look for your fruit, love and find it. May they know and experience your love and forgiveness in this unforgiving world. Lord, as we come back into this building again, let us feel the gift of it afresh. Thank you for our location. We pray to be the neighbours we should be to our community, near and far. Prepare our hearts and spirits for the work and people who you will bring and let us look back at the end of our thousand brave days and be thankful and glad that courage, boldness and humility were evident. Holy Spirit, invade our hearts and to be this people, a people who step into your calling and a people who can because we look to grow more like you, Jesus. Give us strength to suffer and persevere in that suffering as you did so that character is shaped and transformed. Let us be servants who trust and obey you moment by moment. Develop in each one of us a heart for prayer, a mind to learn the scriptures and time alone with you. Let our Bibles be worn out with reading. Deepen our love, knowledge and understanding of you through spiritual discipline. Lord, as we enter this new season, give us dreams and visions and callings. Let us put our mission to love you, to love others and make disciples into practice. And may Northern Life become a place where this happens because we love you and we seek to work together intentionally as your body. Please continue to reveal our gifts and let them be used for your glory. Entrust us with a little and teach us your ways so that you might trust us with much. Let Northern Life be a beacon of your light in this community and as far as the internet reaches. Lord, bless and grow, and grow life hubs as places of real Christian love and fellowship. We pray that you will provide new leaders for new groups and that many not in life hubs will feel drawn to join. Teach us to weave our lives and our love for you together here in relationship with other believers who encourage, challenge and love. Bless world, national and local leaders, leaders with wisdom to navigate the pandemic. We pray for a vaccine and for the availability of that vaccine for all. Bless and protect our families and may your Holy Spirit dwell in our homes and change the hearts of all to know and love you first. Draw those back to you who have wandered during these last months. May they hear your call in their hearts and answer it by coming for Christian fellowship. Lord, bless those who live in darkness. Invade their hearts with light and give them a yearning for truth. Lord, we ask all this in the name of your precious son, Jesus. Amen. Hi everyone, I'm here with Tony Hall today and he's going to share a little bit about how God's provided for him and his family throughout his life. Thanks Tony. When I was 14 I became a follower of Jesus and involved in an open air Sunday school at church and then I went to Beach Mission at Palm Beach for a couple of years and when I was married I wanted to have an outreach with my wife and in 1967 at the beginning of the year we decided I would take the family on a beach mission. Looking forward to that, but come November I was without a job, didn't have any money, virtually. And a man from church rang me to say, I want to talk to you. He offered me $300 to buy and sell merchandise. Mm -hmm. I had actually sold toys and I was employed by Transworld Agents in importing. So I bought $270 worth of toys, $30 we'd allocated to mission, mm -hmm. as was our practice. Set up a toy shop at Northbridge, where Woolworths are today, in a disused coffee shop. Wasn't going too well, but gradually towards Christmas, we started to sell a few. Mm -hmm. I had to leave and get some paper. And Margie, when I came back, was wrapping up toys that a guy had come in, he, he looked as though he couldn't spend anything. And he, he, he came and he said, oh, he's selling toys, love. And Margie told me later. And he said, I'll have that, 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 that. Bundle them up. And out from the front of his apron, yeah. a wad of notes, paid for them. So he had money 
and we committed the, f the fact that we had a tyre on the car that wasn't really roadworthy, but was safe enough to drive up to mm -hmm. Canton Beach. And we prayed that the Lord would meet our needs and supply. So off we went, we arrived. I paid my dues for the family, uh, being because they provide all the food, etc. And on the Tuesday, we got involved talking to a guy I'd never met before who had come down from a conference up the coast and he wanted to visit beach missions to know what was happening. Mm -hmm. He told me his story. He was a Roman Catholic who had become a follower of Jesus. And as he was leaving, he said, who owns the car? And I said, I do. He disappeared and came back carrying a tire. And he said, God told me to put a second spare tire in the boot of my car. and I believe it's for you. So, that afternoon I went down and got the tyre fitted. We didn't have a full tank of petrol to get home, so I spent some money to, on the petrol. The next day after we got home, we met with the men and they... And who'd given you the money. That's right. Yep. And we had five cents left over. The next day on the front doorstep was a large parcel of groceries yep. and in it there was a tin of asparagus and Margie loves asparagus and that, to me that was a special gift for mm -hmm. her and at the day a couple of days later we were given twenty dollars in the letter box now in 1967 twenty dollars bought a lot mm -hmm. and two weeks later I got another job so I look back and I think wow how God's faithfulness mm -hmm. it was like Peter getting out of the boat yeah. walking on the water looking to Jesus and he provided our needs yeah. and this is the way you've lived your life well I gathered 12 missionary boxes before we were married. Every time we'd have a, hear a special speaker at Fellowship Tea, ah, I'll take the missionary box. Mm. There was a time when my brother needed to pay his fees at Moore College. And I thought, I've got enough money to pay that, which he didn't know where it came from. So I got the secretary to type out a, an envelope. And in it, I said, type this, no, go your way and tell no man. and. In those days, the postman came on a Saturday morning and I was standing at the front door when the postman came and here was John's letter. So I gave it to him. Ten minutes later, he came running to me. He said, look at this. And I looked at it and I said, John, whoever sent this said, don't tell anybody. Oh, yeah, but you're my brother. And it was a real blessing. Yeah. He, he didn't find out for years later where it came from. But that, that was just such a thrill to be able to help your brother particularly. I can hear from your voice the giving's as good as the receiving. You enjoy both. That's right. God is faithful. Thanks Tony for that story. And um, would you please stand as I read to us from 2 Corinthians and we're going to sing another song. Uh, as surely as God is faithful, our message to you is not yes and no. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, uh, was not yes and no, but in him it has always been yes. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. Great is 
How do you do this? <laughs> you know, I'm always coughing. I'm, I can cough at home. It's easy. Don't even have to preach. It's all in the can. But Lord, this is so good to be back. We're so privileged to be together again. And we have your word in front of us. And Lord, I need the spiritual gift required of teaching to communicate clearly. You know, I'm out of practice, so I'm just asking for help. And uh, we need ears to hear. So would you speak and encourage us and take all the glory this morning, this afternoon, tonight, in Jesus' name. Amen. So who has appreciated the kids' ministry team with their videos? Man, 
Uh, I hope you can hear us down there, Rach. Um, Rachel and the team have done such a fantastic job, haven't they? One of the, the, the uh, videos that really um, stays in my memory was the one when um, Lockie, our Lockie, was playing Isaac and he was lying on the altar and Hamish was brandishing this knife above him about to sacrifice him and like that sort of brings it home to me when it's your son lying there and of course they're acting out Genesis 22 when God had said to Abraham go and offer your son Isaac on the altar and I thought wow that's a full-on thing to do get him off there Um, and I knew the end of the story because God yells out don't do it Abraham and Abraham stops he doesn't sacrifice Isaac and what does he find a ram in the thicket because our God is a provider amen He provides a substitute. And we're told in Genesis 22 that this is the first time in the Bible we read that God has a name and it's called Jehovah Jireh. He says, my Lord, the provider, Jehovah Jireh. Have you discovered, some of us are living through this really powerfully right now, have you discovered that God is a provider? Anyone? Online, anyone? Yes. Yes. Our God is a provider. And we're in a series we've called I Am Jesus. We're in the Gospel of John. You might like to turn to it. We're in John chapter 6, if you have a Bible with you. Um, We've studied an overview of the entire book of John a few weeks ago. And last week we looked at this incredibly significant statement that First of all, Yahweh made, he said, my name is I am. And then Jesus uh, refers to himself as I am, the name of God. And we looked at the, the, the wonderful significance of that last week. Uh, this week we begin, Lord willing, seven weeks, not counting next week, of looking at the I am statements of Jesus found in John's gospel. So our first one is in John six thirty-five, where Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. In essence, Jesus was saying, I am. I am God. I am God, the provider, Jehovah Jireh. That's me, Jesus saying, I am provider. I am the bread of life that you need to nourish you and it's bread that actually leads to eternal life. This pandemic has had a tremendous impact on our world, hasn't it? I was talking to uh, a tradesman that often does stuff for us, for our car, the other day and he, he, we got chatting and, and he sort of moved to that place, so I got nervous when he did, but uh, moved to that place saying it's all a conspiracy, it's not really real this virus Uh, it's always fascinating isn't it when someone's an expert in one field they can slip in we can all do it get lulled into a confidence that we're experts in all sorts of fields medicine and philosophy and and all the rest and of course there's a power differential going on I want my car back so I'm all ears (laughs) yeah go for it mate tell me what what the truth is Um, but I think people are funny Um, I'm thinking that the medical professions in Madrid and Milan and London and New York. And a lot of us, we we know this stuff is real. It's a very significant thing that's going on in our world. Um, And some of us have, because of COVID-19, been thrust into a place of needing God as provider even more. If you lose your job because of this, suddenly... Maybe you get sick because of this virus, or loved ones do. It changes um, how things work, the rhythm of life. And sometimes um, many of us have have lost aspects of our work or maybe completely lost our work. And, And I think until you have to put a roof over your head, who would agree? You don't quite get what provision is. I don't mean that in a cheeky way, but if you're still under mum and dad's roof and you lose your job and it, like... It's okay, you're not out on the street. They're always going to be there for you. But certainly if you're an immigrant from another country and you're here and you're like, wow, we need provision. And you're either going to work really hard and think it comes from you or you're going to get close to God, yes? We need provision. It's a lie to think you're self-sufficient even when your job's going well and there's lots of income. Life has a way, God has a way of allowing the rug to be pulled out from under us 
and we are reminded we need a provider. And most of all, you and I need a provider of truth to live by, a provider of grace to live in. We need a provider of forgiveness to live out of and hope beyond the grave to live for. And we find this and more in Jesus, who is the bread of life, our provider. So we're in chapter 6 of John's Gospel. Honestly, I, I, I didn't get someone to read it all out because I thought the kids did, the team, they're not all kids, they did such a good job of telling the story. Uh, so that's the story we're looking at. It's one of the great stories of the Bible. The time is Passover. It's springtime. It's not yet Passover. <clears throat> so Jesus is with his disciples in the northeast of the country, up um, around Galilee. He's on the western side of Galilee. He's near Capernaum, his home base. And uh, he's teaching like no one's ever taught before. He's the greatest teacher who ever lived. So he's drawing a crowd. More than that, what's he doing? He's healing the sick. He's performing miracles. So the crowds are drawing. He, he then takes them to the side of a mountain and the acoustics are good and the grass is soft. And then the scripture says that he does a low act on his friend Philip. Right? From the 80s, you remember the low acts we used to talk about? Nobody. <clears throat> John 6, verse uh, 5, when Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall, we buy, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Hence, it felt like a bit of a low act, because Philip is freaked out, acknowledging that this would be prohibitively expensive to do. And this leads to the setup of a beautiful and famous miracle. The feeding of the 5,000. And with emphasis on the word small. From verse 8, we're told the disciple Andrew finds a small boy. If you've got your text there, have a look at it. Um, <clears throat> with small loaves and small fish. And Jesus gets the crowd to sit down in an orderly fashion. He thanks God for the food. And then he proceeds to... Uh, hand out a seemingly never-ending supply of fish and bread to 5,000 men plus women and children. I'm always impressed by the space it would require. Do you ever think about that? Why don't 10,000, 7,000, 8,000 people? There's a, a lot of space required and there's a lot of patience. And I'm thinking of the disciples taking these baskets out and then thinking, I'd like to get amongst some of this. We were all hungry. And then what happens at the end of their patient delivering their servanthood? There are how many basketfuls left over? Twelve, one for each of the main disciples. And I always think, what a wonderful picture that sometimes when we're in ministry, <clears throat> we think we're missing out. Anybody feel like sometimes you can be in ministry and God forgets about you? I think this is just a little vignette, a perfect um, insight into no, God does not miss out on those who are serving. And there's this nice picture of a full basket full for each of the disciples. In the overview of John, we said, and I've got the quote here to have a look at, the stories of chapters 2 to 12 of John's Gospel all follow the same basic pattern. Jesus performs a sign or makes a claim about his divine identity, resulting in misunderstanding or controversy, and in the end, people are forced to make a choice about who they think he is. So there's a sign, and then Jesus gives some insight, some teaching, and the response, the result, is often controversy, and even some people go, whoa. In fact, there's um, a bit of um, venom that comes back towards him sometimes after the sign, the teaching, and then there's a reaction. And so here in chapter 6, after the dust settles on the feeding of the 5,000, there's some clarification. Something goes on resulting in a very unfortunate number, John 6.66. If you're going to be a Bible passage, it's not what you'd choose. <clears throat> John 6.66 tells us, from this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. His disciples. So we have this event, feeding the 5,000, amazing. And then at the end, chapter 6.66, a lot of people say, I'm out. Tap out, I'm out, I'm not following you anymore. I'm a disciple, I used to be, I'm not with you anymore. So what happened in the middle? Well, let's have a look. What did Jesus say? Verse 51, Jesus said, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. 
This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. And then in verse 54, Jesus says, Very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. So you've got to admit, you know, on first reading, it's odd, isn't it? Genuinely, it looks like a cannibal's sort of idea. So what does he mean? <clears throat> well, Jesus in his teaching is using a type of reasoning that we still use today and was popular um, in the first century also, which Aristotle first called an enthymeme. And an enthymeme is this idea where you, we sort of um, logically deduce that if A equals B and B equals C, then it sort of makes sense that A equals C. A equals B, B equals C, then A equals C. So what are some of the aspects of this going on in this somewhat confusing chapter, in a way? We have bread equals life, we're told, and we know that because you know, the Israelites needed manna from heaven, and, and we know it's a staple in lots of the world, bread without bread, my daily bread. I might die, I might starve. The bread equals life. We're told in this passage that Jesus equals bread. So what stands to reason is that Jesus equals life. And then if you keep on sort of digging into what you would find if you had a pen and paper and you wrote down, what is chapter 6 saying? Life equals bread and belief equals life. So belief equals bread. Belief equals bread equals Jesus equals life. So clear. And, and out of all that, Jesus is saying, I am the bread of life. When belief equals bread equals Jesus equals life, he's saying believing in Jesus provides eternal life. And we have to always remember what the, the gospel was written for. John chapter 20, verse 31 the end of John's gospel, he said, these things are written that you may believe. That you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So we open up chapter 6 and there's the feeding of the 5,000 and the bread of life. And it all sounds a lot about bread and nourishment. And we can get a bit lost in the analogy, but what it's really about is Jesus equals bread equals life equals belief, belief equals life. Um, it's about believing in the one who is true bread, the true provision of heaven that will change and nourish us and give us eternal life. And I want to just quickly look at some of the verses you find. If you, if you look at it with the lenses, what is John telling me about belief? Because he wrote the book that we might believe. In the midst of all this analogy, this metaphor about Bread. It's not as though I'm saying it wasn't a real miracle. It was. But what does the bread really mean? Verse 29. I'm just going to really quickly read out some of the text that we see in this chapter. The work of God is this, verse 29, to believe in the one he has sent. Verse 30. So they asked him, what sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? The people know that this is about belief. What sign will you give us? Because the point of the bread, if you did a sign like that, would be that I might believe. Verse 35, Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Again, it's all about bread and life. But then he shifts it. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. And we're seeing this connection between the bread and belief and life. Verse 36, but as I told you, you have seen me, and still you do not believe, because it's about belief. Verse 40, for my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. Verse 47, very truly I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, which kept them alive, because that's what bread does. Yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. 
I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Are you starting to see, if you break it down, it's not anything about eating flesh, is it? (laughs) And I know most of us know that here, but it's actually really clear. Eating the flesh, it's about belief. Will you consume the words of Jesus and actually believe he is the one that he says he is? Belief equals bread equals Jesus equals life. The last couple I want to just point out. Verse 64, yet there are some of you who do not believe because it's about belief. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do not want to leave too, do you? Looking at the twelve. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to what? Believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. So this whole chapter is it's a wonderful miracle. It's a great kid's story. It's about gospel. It's about believing in the one who can make a way for us to get through death and into eternal life. Jesus is the bread of heaven because in and through his life, death and resurrection, he has made a way for people to be forgiven and through faith in Christ to live forever. Now, I don't know, maybe you're very new to Christianity. Maybe you just walked in and this is the first time you've ever been in a church. So sometimes when I'm reading a passage like that, I think this is confusing for me and most of us who are Christians, let alone someone brand new. So what I just said, let me just in a gap two minutes give you a very brief summary of what we would believe as Christians and never will follow along here sin is real that, that, that is what the Bible would teach that something in us that we just know is, it's not right um, there's a bent towards that which is not of God and not good and that sin which we've all committed it separates us from the God who made us that's what the Bible tells, tells us sin requires a judgement in a moral universe if there's not a moral universe that we live in Maybe it doesn't matter what we do, but the Bible certainly puts forward something many of us would believe from just deep in our gut. There is good and there's there's wrong. Um, We're all sinners, the Bible tells us, and that's bad news. That's really bad news because it means we're all destined to be judged for our sin. The good news is the Bible says Jesus came as a human being, one of us, to live the life that we could never live as the bread of life, to die our death in our place, to pay for our sin and in a way prepay for the judgment that we would have had to have endured so that we didn't have to die eternally as the punishment for our sin. But instead we could be forgiven and therefore receive what we were first created for, new creation, a perfect world where there's no power of contrary choice, no sin. And to live forever with God on that perfect earth. Does that sound like a plan? It's the good news of the gospel. It's what Christianity is all about. It's this divine exchange. Jesus takes what I deserve. I take what he deserves. How do I get that? Jesus takes what I deserve. I take what he deserves. The answer is belief. Not just like the devil believes that God is there, but belief that he is my Lord and my Saviour and he's worthy of my life. I believe the words he said. I believe his claims on me as part of his creation. We need to believe. Um, It's what we need above everything else. Yes, we need shelter. I've never been long term without shelter. I can't imagine how hard that would be. We need food. We need water. Maybe even more, we need relationships and purpose, but what do we need most? We need salvation if, if you're going to survive beyond the grave. We need, need salvation. We need our sin to be paid for. We need to be made right with God. That's what belief is for. It's the provision of Jehovah Jireh, the great provider. It's who Jesus is. It's why he says, I'm the bread of life. What's interesting is Jesus rises from the dead 
and sends his spirit to fill every believer. We can read about it in Acts. Um, So that Jesus could live his life through those who believe. And that's why the, the Bible says that believers in Christ, we're known as the church, and through the spirit, we are the what of Christ? The body of Christ. So we're the body of Christ and he's the bread of life. We quoted this verse last week. Now you are the body of Christ and each one of you is part of it. It's pretty special, isn't it? I mean, it's something we get used to hearing, but I'm trying to make a big emphasis on it. It's pretty amazing. Somehow we are the body of Christ through belief by the Spirit living in us, the Spirit of Jesus. And God has placed in the church, first of all, apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, of helping, of guidance, and of different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers? Do all work, work miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? No, different gifts. Now eagerly desire the greater gifts, Paul writes. Those of us who believe have eaten the bread of life. We're going to live forever, but there's stuff for us to do right now. We're filled with the Spirit, and in a weird way, remember, weird is okay. We were talking about something that sounded like cannibals before. Um, We are the body of Christ. So what I'm putting out there, and it's a genuine question I've been asking people, is it okay to say that we are the bread of life? I feel weird saying it, but again, it's okay to be a bit weird. Jesus is the ultimate bread of life, of course. But if we are his body and he's a being who doesn't change, then I'm, I'm pretty convinced there's an aspect of the church that we reflect the bread of life. If you really find a theological reason for that to be wrong, I would love to talk to you <laughs> I don't want to get it wrong. But I just, I find it really quite fascinating to go, wow, Jesus is the bread of life. We're his body. Remember the enthymeme? That means, well, what would it mean for us to be the bread of life to the glory of Jesus and all because of Jesus? So then it got me thinking, well, how have we been gifted? Maybe there are certain gifts. And of course, you could say every gift is part of the full manifest presence of Jesus. Of course. But I thought, I just wonder if, There are some gifts that are more obviously the demonstration of the bread of life. So up here, here's a list. You can find different lists, but um, this is a list of the spiritual gifts. And uh, so I've spoken to lots of people, a couple of life groups, life hubs, and um, said, what do you reckon? And so we brainstormed and then prayed a lot. Where I came to was I think these three gifts best represent the bread of life. Faith, giving, the next one, slide. Faith, giving, and miracles. And let me ask, explain why. Before I do, can I ask, who has the gift of faith, giving, or miracles? Could you raise your hand? Well, that's an interesting question. Don't we all have faith? I reckon there's a gift of faith because it talks about being a gift of faith. It's just an interesting thought. Um, It's one of the spiritual gifts. Um, So that's interesting from my perspective because not many hands went up. I wonder if that means we're not that familiar with spiritual gifts. Maybe spiritual gifts don't matter that much. Let me ask you again. Faith, miracles and giving. If faith wasn't the faith that you used to get saved with. Faith, giving and miracles. Okay, there's not many hands that go up. All right. Well, you've got a big job. (laughs) You've got a big job here. You've got to be the bread of life, maybe. So I want to talk about the gift of giving. Um, When you think about the story, bread of life, and the teaching we've just seen, it's about believing. This gift is so... uh, It's so... This story is so often obviously about giving, isn't it? It's about giving. Like... Jesus, a massive crowd, they're in need, there are a few resources and they're freely giving. And uh, just as Jesus gave his life to come to the earth and freely gave it away um, so that people through belief could come to know him. Um, 
Next week we celebrate, it's actually today, if you want to know, to the, ironically, today is the one year anniversary. One year ago we were having our big celebration for the first time. But we're going to celebrate it next week. But we've talked about a thousand brave days. You know, we, we had, we've raised a bit over $100,000 as a church. And what impresses me is we, we didn't need to do it in essence because there was money in the bank. But we did it because of believing that we could empower a generous budget that's kingdom oriented and Jesus glorifying. And people gave over $100,000. It was a big challenge, and we met it, and we actually pledged about $130,000. Now, does every person who gave generously have a gift of giving? I don't think so. I think people can give without the gift of giving. But I think some of us have this thing called the gift of giving. And I think I've observed giving just flows for you when you have that. You just don't have to think about it. It's just like a natural ability that you have, but it happens to be spiritual. You know deep in your boots. Tony sort of said it. He's like, why wouldn't you give it? And you enjoyed it. And Virginia had that great line. It seems like you love receiving as much as giving. That's the gift of giving. It's exciting when people can just say, I don't have to be convinced. God has given me these resources for the sake of his glory. Not everyone feels that, of course, we should. But you know what? It's the way God designs it. Some people have it uh, more powerfully. What happens when uh, a church is crazily generous, especially those with the gift of giving? Amazing things can happen. Sometimes God gives us the ability to make money. Sometimes have like, you know, the Midas touch. I have discovered that that doesn't always link to the gift of giving. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Um, so I want to suggest to you the gift of giving is a way that we can be in Jesus the bread of life because the bread of life is about provision and when you've got resources that you can give away, obviously we need to be that church. Second is the gift of miracles. Now this again is a weird one. Um, to me it seems like the gift of giving is, of miracles is a transient gift. I think in God's wisdom... I haven't met many people that say, I've got the gift of miracles and it stays with me. Anyone agree? Yeah, yeah it's like, I don't even quite know <clears throat> like, what the difference is. I think it's quite hard to tell. We ask God for miracles, he does miracles, he still does them. Which would be a gift of miracles and which wouldn't? I, I'm not quite sure. But let's take the word of God on its merits. Um, talks about the gift of miracles. This is clearly a miracle which Jesus chose to use to reveal the truth, which was that he's the bread of life, which is all about people believing. So I'm thinking, if we're the bread of life, we should expect people will have the gift of miracles. And when we do that in the name of Jesus, it will point people to believe. Amen? Like it, clearly. It's just if you do the maths, people go, what will you do to help us believe? Do a sign. And I hear that all the time as people, um, in fact, we were all stirred by Tony's testimony. It was a miraculous provision. It stirs our belief, doesn't it? So we need this. We need the gift of miracles to be manifest, that we would point people to the bread of life who is Jesus, and he's more than the bread of life. He's the saviour of the world. Last one I want to suggest is the body of Christ reveals the bread of life through the gift of faith. Surely apart from Jesus himself in this story, who is the unsung hero? Who do you reckon? Surely it's the boy. Surely in this story. Like Jesus, yes, he is the hero. Philip, Andrew, they're bit parts. But this jolly small boy with his lunch and his big heart, what a star. What a star, what a legend. Gives up his lunch not knowing that it would be used for a good purpose. I want to believe that Andrew didn't come and cajole him. I want to believe the young boy said, I've got, Mr, I've got some food. <laughs> Imagine that. That's a great picture, isn't it? He doesn't quite know. He just believes this Jesus could do anything with my resources. Here's my lunch. We could have some interesting stories here today, couldn't we? When we have stepped out in faith. I've told you this story many times before. It's one of my sort of favourite stories in my life. When I was about 16, 
Um, my dad was singing at the Sydney Opera House. I'm proud of my dad, so that's why I talk about him every now and then. He's gone home to glory now. But he was singing with Luciano Pavarotti. And whenever I tell the story, most people go, oh, who is that? He's only the most famous opera singer who ever lived. <clears throat> big man, big voice, very famous Italian. Anyway, they're singing some years ago. I was 16, so it's back in the 80s. And uh, I'm in the green room. We were always at the opera house because we've grown up with dad being a full-time singer. And, uh, and I've just got myself an orange juice. And Luciano Pavarotti comes towards me. He's about 170 kilos. He's a big boy. And he comes up and he says, young man, uh, I'm not a racist if I try to do an Italian accent, but he's like, can I have a drink of your orange juice? That wasn't good. Um, uh, better not to do it anyway, you know? <laughs> um, But anyway, I'm thinking, oh, jeez. This is a power, powerful guy. I, I, I guess he wants to buy it off me or something. So I've just bought it from the, the machine. And um, I give it to him, and he, he just skulls it. And he just skulls the whole thing. And he looked, you know, it's almost like, it's like a king, medieval king with his beard. And he looks at me and he says, oh, that will teach you to trust the fat man. And to be honest, I thought he would give me five bucks. He just walked off. I was like, wow. And that sort of sticks in my mind that he was the powerful one, I wasn't. He nicked off with my drink. I think it would have been a disturbing experience if he didn't have a gift of faith for this small boy. Give me your lunch. Like Luciano Pavarotti, nicking off with my drink. I do forgive him, Lord. <laughs> but I think this idea of that small boy, it just inspires me. I have a gift of faith and have since I was a young man. It seems to have stayed with me. And I look at that small boy and I go, hey, go get him, mate. That's, that's awesome. That inspires me. What is it like to have a gift of faith? You believe deep down, no matter what, Jesus is worth it. It doesn't mean you always get that as your um, ultimate agenda. But it's not hard in a group. For you to voice, Jesus is worth it. He is worth my lunch. He's worth your lunch. He's worth our best. He's worth our best. The local church is worth it. It's worth us having a go, not sitting back and wondering. And that's the gift of faith that says, hey, yeah, let's go for it. I think Peter had the gift of faith, right? Par excellence. Who's stepping out of a boat following Peter? Sometimes the gift of faith gets it completely wrong, but it still believes. Do you have the gift of faith? Do you have the gift of faith? If you do, use it and allow the Lord to inspire others to believe that Jesus is who he said he was and is. How has God gifted you? Only Jesus is the great I am, but mysteriously we as his body represent him and we can only represent him properly together. Together we're the body of Christ. I am not Christ and neither are you, but somehow mystically we are together. Amen? And you look around and you think that can't be true. I don't mean that cheekily, like it can't be true because I'm part of that group. How can I be part of Jesus? But we are. We are by his grace. So let's come back to the purpose of this message, to give glory to Jesus because he is Jehovah Jireh. He is the great provider. What do you need today? One of the wonderful truths about Jesus, I remember learning from Dallas Willard years ago, is that if you look in the Gospels, you'll find many times where Jesus walks up to someone and he says, Morgan, what would you like me to do for you? And just hearing that, it's like, he would never ask me that, would he? But he's the bread of life. He's the great provider. What if he does that? What if he goes, Stephanie, what would you like me to do for you? What do you say? You go, oh, am I allowed to ask? Lord, I mean, you tell me. And Jesus is like, I love you. I created you. I don't want to tell you what to do all the time. I'll point you in the right direction. If you ask me, I'll give you guidance. But what would you like me to do for you, Tony? That's Jehovah Jireh, amen? <clears throat> That's Jesus, the bread of life. He goes, I've got plenty of bread. They needed it in the wilderness. 
I was in heaven, we sent the manna. And then I came. And I'm still ready to come and meet people's needs. No matter what. What do you need? Yesterday, um, a, good, a good mate of ours, um, John, who might, might be watching, uh, told us this great story that literally he's got really bad shoulders, needs to get operations on his shoulders, and he's working with his family business, the construction, and he's got to, um, I don't know why I feel emotional, um, it was just a really cool story, um, but he's got to screed out a massive area of concrete yes, the day before yesterday. And, uh, and he's out west, and he's just, you're stuck in place. There's, there's a big tr- concrete truck coming. He's like, my shoulders are so bad. He's having a reconstruction done in December. He's like, oh, God, I, I'm just lifting it up to you. You're the provider. I think I'm emotional because of being back, not because of the story. It's concrete mixing. <laughs> but uh, this great, great prov- provision. Um, the guy turns up, and he says... You look like you're struggling. I was a concrete, like, what's it called? Like, layer, screeder for 15 years. Don't tell anybody. So if you, anyone's looking, don't go looking for this guy. But he, he runs a concrete mixing company, but he's an expert screeder. So he did the whole thing and taught his son, who's an apprentice, how to do a job that John didn't know how to do very well. So praise God, hey, like, you know, you can be in just the everyday and you're like, oh, gee, Jesus, are you still the bread of life? Are you still the provided? Can you, can you provide for me now? I need a concrete screeder. Where would you find one out west? Oh, that bloke. Because the whole key, right, is that Jesus is out of time and he's got all eternity to answer our last minute prayer. Hallelujah. That's why he's a great provider. He cheats. He knows exactly what we need. So let's pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus, so much for the way that you provide. You provide miraculously. You provide very pragmatically in very normal ways, ways that we sometimes miss. But Lord Holy Spirit, would you prompt us now to recognize the abundant provision in our lives. We don't want to be people that are, that are ungrateful. So help us see where you've provided and prompt us for what we need to ask for the future. Lord, if you could gift us with whatever it requires for us to point people to belief, we're just here waiting. Lord, Holy Spirit, would you make manifest in us the gifts? that we could point people to Jesus as the provider. Lord, maybe it is the gift of giving. Maybe it's the gift of miracles and faith, but that's just a hunch. We leave it all at your feet. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Would you please stand? We're going to sing one last song to close the service. And I just encourage you, we're just going to give Jesus glory. And you might like to try maybe closing your eyes or experimenting with body posture since you can't sing. So I'm just, I guess, giving you freedom to do what you need to do to worship. There is a name who reigns without contention. Whose power can be questioned or contained With humble fame He rules the earth and heavens His glory knows no measure or refrain And it's burst and past the borderlines of space Jesus Enthroned upon the praises of our hearts Jesus, 
You're the king and you're the center of it all There is a name Reaching past the margins Calling sons and daughters back to him And as he saves We can hear the roar of heaven as prodigals are coming home again Oh, the triumph of His name will never end Jesus, enthroned upon the praises of our hearts Jesus, you're the King center of it all For every eye will see Every heart will know There is no We believe these things are true. Everything we've just sung about you, we give you glory as the bread of life. We ask that your spirit would be moving in us this week, uh, manifesting itself in our giftings, Lord. We want to be the body of Christ, and we want to do your will on earth. So we give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great week. We'll see you next week. Sorry.